Well, good morning and welcome to all again uh, for this, the third session on the quantum. Um, I want to thank uh, Christine and Debbie again uh, for making all of this happen and work. I am one of those dumb ones who couldn't get on YouTube, but now that uh, I've heard the instructions for the second time, um, hopefully I'll get it. Um, anyway, um, so this is uh, this is a, a departure. Um, the first two were about the universe writ large, and now we're talking about the quantum, or uh, to think of it another way, as a a, a particle universe. Um, but before we do that, each presentation I've uh, wrangled a little bit of anthropology in. So the, the two heads that you're looking at there are Neanderthals. And, um, and uh, particularly the one on, on the left has a rugged, uh, uh, thick uh, browed, uh, heavy uh, appearance. Um, and the man on, on the right, it's hard to think that he's not modern human, but apparently he is Neanderthal. So um, it is an interesting point because uh, there aren't that many fossils around. And uh, with any species, including our own, there's a great deal of variation uh, in appearance and, um, and other behavioral and cognitive skills. Uh, so there's a lot of variation within a species. And, um, and, um, and have a lot of overlap between species. So um, there was an interesting article um, just a week or no, I guess last week about Neanderthals and uh, beginning maybe 50, 60,000 years ago, maybe longer, um, the Y chromosome on Neanderthals wasn't Neanderthal, wasn't a Y wasn't a human, at least wasn't a Neanderthal Y chromosome, it was a modern human. So that speaks to uh, the cross breeding or interbreeding between species, but also that sometimes uh, things can happen that spread widely through a species. So uh, from those Neanderthals that they have, uh, in which they've examined uh, their ancient DNA, now ancient DNA, um, Interestingly enough, um, they have a modern version of the Y chromosome, uh, whatever the impact of that might have been. I don't know, but it's, um, you know, just a little, oh, here we are. So uh, one of the questions about the anisols uh, uh, that I think has largely been answered now in the last 30 years, uh, they certainly weren't the dim-witted uh, characters uh, uh, that we thought they were for so many thousands of years, uh, at least for the last uh, century and a half. And um, it turns out that they created art and some quite sophisticated cave art. And here's an example from Spain. And this would go back at least 60,000 years, 20,000 years earlier than any modern humans were about. So did they have the imagination uh, to create art, yes. Did they have the imagination? And it was an image I've used with you before and with the very first slide in this series of showing the Milky Way. Did they wonder when they looked at the sky? Did they wonder about uh, where their place was in the cosmos? And, um, and, and they certainly, uh, some of them at least, uh, buried their dead in a way that um, makes one think that there was some sense of the afterlife. So um, those were traits that were thought to be exclusively human. They clearly are not. Uh, they also used uh, shells as jewelry. And here's another example. So um, we'll say more about that as we move along. Now, the quantum. Around 1900, remember I, I mentioned uh, early in the, in the series that, that uh, there were uh, uh, not a few physicists who had a lot of issues with the whole problem of atoms, whether they existed or not. 
it seems hard to square with the periodic table. But anyway, uh, some of them, including Max Planck, uh, just couldn't buy the issue of atoms. Um, what they were used to, and, and by the way, while we're on this, I, I don't know whether I mentioned this before, but, uh, but Isaac Newton postulated, without evidence, but postulated that, that, um, that light was made up of particles. Now, he had one uh, interesting observation to differentiate between the waveform theory and, and particle theory. He said, now imagine you're walking down a street and you come to a corner and somebody is on the other street. You can't see them yet, but you can hear their voice, but you can't see them. Well, think about that. Obviously, the sound waves can come around the corner. That's how you hear them. But light doesn't bend around the corner. That's why you can't see them. So an interesting um, uh, light at least, uh, uh, way of uh, thinking about the different nature of sound and, and light. Uh, now, um, the electrification of North America and Europe was taking place in the, the beginning in the mid 1800s and forward. It was, it was a big booming industry and uh, Europe wanted to be a player and uh, Germany in particular invested heavily in this and uh, they used uh, various experimental models for this and one of them was called black body radiation. And this, uh, it didn't matter what the shape of the black body was um, or, or the material, except that it was usually metal, the walls of the, of the black body. And it had a small little peephole uh, to allow investigators to uh, assess and uh, quantify the radiation coming out of the, the, uh, the black body, which was then heated. And um, so I'll show you an example of that later. The other, so that was one that involved Max Planck and was one solution to it and a reluctant one at that. And Albert Einstein, another solution. Um, and, um, and he was much more confident about that than Max Planck. I mentioned before last week that they became the best of friends. Then there's the whole issue of the photoelectric uh, effect. Uh, if light is shone on a metal uh, with the appropriate frequency and energy, it will loosen electrodes, shed electrodes, and, um, and they can pass through a current. And, and the issue was, well, about the nature of the incident light. The shine, that was shone on one of the one of the plates. Was it particle or was it a waveform? Well, we'll see how that worked out as we move along. Now, again, a reminder of uh, the ground on which we stood. Um, Isaac Newton, the laws described a very comprehensive universe. A falling apple and an orbiting moon were governed by the same rules of gravity, mass, uh, and motion. And, um, and more, uh, I wouldn't say more importantly, but causes produced effects. Forces acted on objects. And in theory, everything could be explained, determined, and predicted. So a Newtonian universe was a very predictive universe. Now, um, the quantum exists in biology as functional units and subunits. For example, the cell might be thought of as a, as the, as a quantum in biology. Um, so skin cells, immune cells, nerve cells, any kind of cell, as well as some of the subcomponents of those cells. Uh, neurotransmitter release, I'll illustrate that in just a second, and sensory re reception, visual and touch. There are receptors that, uh, that respond to an on. So if the stimulus might be maintained by pressing on my finger here, it, it uh, begins to fire for the period of time of the stimulus. 
and then I look at the finger and it stops. Or it just signals when I touch it, and even if I maintain it, it goes off. So it signals on, off. Um, uh, so let's move along to, here's a study that I was involved in um, some years ago, but it, it shows, the illustrates the quadral nature of neurotransmitter release. In this case, this is a single motor nerve fiber contacting a single muscle fiber. And the recordings that you're looking at, at least at the top in A, are um, um, a series of these changes in the transmembrane potential. And they're all more or less the same. They're not exactly the same, but they're almost the same. And they're not nothing, nor are they two or three times or five times that. They're more or less the same. And they correspond, if you look at the nerve terminal, there are little uh, sacs and they contain the molecules of acetylcholine. So that's the quantal aspect, aspect of, in this case, nerve muscle transmission. And the bottom series are actually, uh, I think these were recorded from me, from the gastrocnemius, my gastrocnemius muscle, near where the nerve enters the muscle. And here's that little, uh, those little quantal releases, those little blips indicating uh, the release of another quantum, another vesicle of acetylcholine. So there's a good illustration of a quantal phenomenon in biology. But it also exists, as you know, in the universe, and we talked about this last week, atoms or in stars because of the heat, their ions, and the whole process of the synthesis of uh, heavier metals from lighter ones. So, and molecules, the combination of atoms and the elementary particles within an atom. And we're going to talk about that next week, the proton and the neutron and the electron and beyond that. And also that, uh, that will be the subject of next week is the quantal nature of these electron orbits. Are they higgly-piggly or is there an order to it? Well, there clearly is an order to it. There are specific radii for successive, for successive the further out orbits. And energy is absorbed and emitted uh, when electrons jump from one orbit to another. So that's the quantal, one of the quantal aspects uh, of the structure of the atom. So that's next week. Now, James Maxwell, um, well, there were two giants in the 1800s, Faraday and Maxwell. And they were both very interested in the electromagnetic spectrum and the relationship of one to the other. Maxwell in particular developed these beautiful equations which specified how changing electric fields produced magnetic fields and that the magnetic fields in turn could be used to produce electric current. Now of these, Einstein was a huge fan of James Maxwell's work. And what appealed to him, well, here's the quote, it needed great scientific imagination to realize that it's not the charges nor the particles, but the field in the space between the charges and the particles, which is essential for describing physical phenomena. He spent, from the time he left Europe in 1932 or 33, because of the rise of Hitler and moved to the United States, he spent until the day he died. He was really obsessed with this idea of the field, that, that uh, the classical physics had missed this and the quant quantum physics had missed it too. And the whole concept of the field effect was, uh, was the underlying reality. So I move along here because I just thought about this in the last minute, because when I was at London Health Sciences and, um, and again in Boston, um, I sometimes, we, we were involved in studies of, uh, that, that are, at least that involved stimulating the brain, but non-invasively. Now I've done, I've certainly been there when the, when the skull's been opened up and, and uh, helped the surgeon to localize the function by stimulating much the way that uh, 
preceded us 30 or 40 years of the pen field in, in Montreal, but we were more interested, or we were, at least I was very interested, could we actually access the motor system, the central motor system, non-invasively and without pain? Well, um, uh, Cambridge University and, um, and the National Hospital of Queen Square and others uh, came together in the 1980s and 90s and developed an interesting tool. And it, and it really speaks to the field concept because you see those yellow rings there. That's a, they would be like about the size of my, the, the two ones I'm making with my thumb and, and, um, and index finger there and hooked together. And if you pass a very strong current, very high uh, current through those coils, it induces a magnetic field at right angles. See the green there? It induces a magnetic field, a changing magnetic field, and it's very brief. And that magnetic field passes through air, the scalp, the skull, and into the brain with no pain. You're not aware. I've I've, my brain's been stimulated many times with this tool. There's nothing that you feel. There is no pain. But it is a little unnerving, uh, to say the least, to if I hold that uh, stimulator, say, over my right motor area for my hand or forearm and click those, and then the opposite hand and thumb move and the muscles contract. Or if I move it higher up, it'll be my leg that, that moves. So here are fields, right? You passed a high current around those yellow, you can see them there. It induces a magnetic field. That magnetic field creates an electric field which is accompanied by that current, which stimulates the nerve cells. So there's a very practical example of the field concept, something you can't see, but it's very effective. So that's, um, I thought it was an interesting example. And actually, here's a practice. Just look at the top series of, because in this case, what was happening is that uh, I think this is me again, but uh, they were recording from my hand muscles, I think, and stimulating the, the nerve at the wrist, and again, very close to the spinal cord, and then the opposite cortex. And uh, so you can see the comparison between the, the, uh, the central, the, the cortical uh, stimulus, the response to that, the response to stimulation of the spinal root and at the wrist. So all of this field business, uh, just because of this talk, I went back and I looked at some of the work that I'd done and thought, gee, no, that's a, that's a good way of illustrating it. Um, now, what about the waveform nature of light? Well, but one of the classical ways of illustrating this is to have a screen and two holes in the screen. And you shine a light uh, on the screen and the light that passes through, the light passes through both of those holes and then it spreads out. And it spreads out from both holes and they overlap with one another. And where they, uh, uh, and at some points they're additive and create large, larger waves. In other places they cancel one another out. Um, but so that's called interference. That's a classical phenomenon related to waves. It's like, the, or to make it even simpler, throwing a stone in a pond and you can see the ripples moving out uh, from where the stone hit the water. So, um, let's, uh, well, what about how does light behave as a particle? Well, you would think that if you had a gun and you could fire electrons one at a time, single shots, that, that the particle would head to the target and, for example, go through, go back to the original screen and just go through one of those holes. But you know the paradox? If you stimulate with single shots of electrons, one electron each time, it actually manages to go through both holes. And furthermore, 
if you repeat it enough times, they actually interfere with one another, just like the waveform pattern. So it's, again, one of those paradoxes that light, whether particle or waveform, it actually has dual properties. And this includes at the subatomic level. So, uh, and you'll see that next week. Now, this is probably one of the most famous letters in science. And um, Albert Einstein is a young man who's working um, at the patent office. He hasn't finished his PhD. It's uh, 1905. He's about to submit something for his PhD. And he sends this letter to his best friend. And I included both parts of this because it's, it's funny. Uh, the, the first paragraph, such a solemn air of silence has descended between us. I almost feel as if I've been committing a, sacri a sacrilege. Um, so what are you, a frozen whale, you smoke dried canned piece of soul? Why have you still not sent me your dissertation? Don't you know that I am one of the one and a half fellows who would actually read it with pleasure? That's the opening paragraph. Well, then we come to this, re this remarkable paragraph here. I promise you four papers in return. The first deals with radiation and the energy properties of light. It's very revolutionary, as you will see uh, when I send the work. That got on the Nobel Prize. The second paper is the determination of the true sizes of atoms. That was a prosaic piece, which got him his PhD. The third proves that bodies of the order of the magnitude of one one thousandth of a millimeter, suspended in liquids, must already perform an observable random motion that is produced by thermal motion. Well, this is Brownian movement. You remember that from your high school days? Pollen seeds in, in water. If you watch them at a still and at nothing else other than the ambient temperature, they will kind of randomly jostle around in the water. Why do they jostle around in the water? And then the fourth paper is only a rough draft at this point, but um, it is on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, which employs a modification of the theory of space and time. A modification? This is relativity we're talking about here. This is the first shot over the bow. This is special relativity and general relativity follows in 10 years. So uh, that's quite a letter. So let's um, look at this as Einstein might have looked at it. And uh, so that second paragraph, I mean, he's enamored with Maxwell. He, he's still, at heart, he's a, he's, a, uh, he's a classical physicist, as most were for that day. And he said, uh, well, we consider the state of a body to be completely determined by the positions and velocities of a very large yet finite number of atoms and electrons. That would be the particle world, the Newtonian world. We make use of continuous spatial functions to describe the electromagnetic state of a given volume. That's Maxwell speaking. That's the wave theory. How do you reconcile those two? They seemingly, here's the rift in physics at the time. These beautiful equations of, of Maxwell, they work, they describe things beautifully. And then there's this particular world. And uh, so what happens then? Now here's the paper uh, that, um, that, that won on the Nobel Prize. So it's, um, he's very, for all of his brashness, uh, Einstein's astute and, um, and he's cautious. He knows he's not talking. He's not talking to a um, a sympathetic audience. 
meaning his fellow physicists. Not that they're hostile, but they're, but they're products of classical physics. So what does he say in the third word of the sentence, the opening sentence? On a heuristic point of view, heuristic meaning provisional, He's not claiming this is the answer. He's kind of pointed out to you as a possibility, something to think about. Um, and um, so at the heart of this paper were questions that had bedeviled physicists for a century. Well, I've already talked about those. Now, here's what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes. Max Planck's analysis of this black body radiation. Um, something about the photoelectric effect, but I'll actually jump after Max Planck to Albert Einstein's. Max Planck approached black body radiation in a very different way than Einstein. They came to the same conclusion, but Einstein's was far more brilliant and far more comprehensive because he was less reluctant. He was bold. And um, so let's, let's move along here. Well, let's get to black body radiation. Um, if you heat metal in a kiln, depending on the temperature, the, the, the metal changes color. Well, we see this on our stove, right? So first of all, when you turn the switch on or light the light on it, it's, um, there's um, the metal anyway, um, doesn't change color. And it may feel warm and even uncomfortably warm, but you still can't see any color change because it's in the still the longer wavelength. And, and then into red and then into orange, uh, and then through, through eventually kind of white and blue in the ultraviolet way. So as you increase the temperature, the wavelengths that radiate become shorter and shorter. All right, so that, that's important. Now, here's a, a black box. I'll just walk you through this. It's hard to do this because I don't have a pointer that would work here. But the, the bigger the hump, the higher the temperature in the black body radiation. The, the curve covers the distribution of the intensity of the energy over various wavelengths, beginning on, on the right side with the shortest, or at least with the longest wavelengths, and moving to the shorter uh, shortest wavelengths on your left. The visible part of that radiation, the visible light, you can see. All right. Now, the important point about this is that the intensity of the energy emitted is strictly a function of the temperature, but not the material in the container. Not related to the material in the container. This is a property of temperature alone. Now, this experimental, evi ex experimental evidence, by the way, this is all in the, the in trying to design better light bulbs. So try to understand the science better. So um, these experimental results were very reproducible. So then several people thought, well, is there a way of uh, using mathematics to describe this curve and therefore give us some idea, some meaning, some understanding of how it came about. And several people tried and they failed because it would go wrong at one or other end of the spectrum. And then Planck came along and uh, had another look at this. And that there, by the way, is a picture of Max Planck. And, um, um, oh, well, I'll take a few moments out and just compare the two. Max Planck was uh, uh, 
he was a German through and through. He was fiercely proud of being German. Uh, an ardent patriot. This has nothing to do with the Nazis or what happened in the 30s and 40s. Um, uh, he was Prussian. He was shy. He was very formal in manner, conservative in instinct, very cautious. And you'll see that written in spades as I described this black body radiation. And, uh, and he was a family man. I mean, the way this man spent most of his evenings was at home with music. And one or other members of the family, including him, would be playing a, an instrument or maybe several or their guests participating. Albert Einstein, um, well, he didn't care what he, what he pressed in, it didn't seem to. Uh, supremely confident, audacious, um, an internationalist. Now, um, Albert Einstein was born in Germany. He renounced his citizenship in, at the age of 16. He was actually stateless for about two to three years. But he didn't want to be thought of as German. He was social. He was probably one of the more fun of the physicists to be around. He was witty, but he's totally a loader when it came to his work. These were not group activities, as you will find next week with Niels Bohr. These were problems to be solved alone by him. He's very thorough and very imaginative. So we have a traditionalist on the left, Max Planck. Um, Albert Einstein, yes, traditionalist, but, um, but willing to, to uh, he, he was open. So moving along. Now let's look carefully at Max Planck's solution for black body radiation. You know, the details here, I debated about how much to include in here, but really, unless you, um, unless you sometimes understand what, what happened, it's hard to appreciate what the debate was about or the magnitude or the value of the work. Well, what did Max Planck up there. And this is very much summarized. He came up with an equation. I would call it kind of a bastardized equation that worked, meaning it accounted for the shape of the black body radiation at any given temperature. So um, he met his goal, the first one to do it. But he did it in a way that he was uncomfortable with. He was not a fan of Ludwig Boltzmann. Um, not so much he, that was nothing personal, just with the Boltzmann support for atoms and, um, and his statistical methods. But he found he couldn't, he couldn't solve this mathematically without adopting Boltzmann's statistical methods and using what he called a fortunatus guess. He guessed. And what was the guess? He incorporated a constant. He didn't know it at the time, but it be, would become one of the most uh, central constants, most important constants in the universe. It would be Planck's constant, but he didn't know that then. So it worked, but what did it mean? It was very important to understand in those days to understand what mathematics meant. I mean, you might have uh, a series of equations, but if you couldn't visualize what it actually meant, then how, did you, how do you know it's really true? And the, uh, so he struggled for months, working late evenings, weekends, trying to figure out what, what the physical meaning of his equation was. And he contrived uh, uh, an answer to that. And he imagined that the surface of anything that was radiating this radiation, emitting radiation in the black body, were uh, like uh, little springs or, um, that, that, uh, that emitted energy in packets. 
or bundled. It was bundled energy. So what he's really saying is it's quantal, but he doesn't really want to say that. And he considered the constant that he introduced as a mere calculational contrivance to make things work. Um, well, that's how he looked on his constant, not how Einstein looked at it. When Einstein looked at this, he knew that where Planck had been hesitant and, and, um, and cautious, super cautious, he knew that, that, that the answer was that the light, the radiation was quartal in nature. And he did one of these, uh, it, it shows uh, that his, uh, he, he was, uh, he'd educated himself. He was self-taught um, and uh, wasn't the best of students. He was best left to his own to sort stuff out. But one of the lessons he learned in the uh, patent office is to be a very good critic of anything that came across his desk. Look for the flaws. What did somebody miss? What did they, um, where did they kind of mess up here? What did they leave out? And, um, and that's how we looked at, that's how we looked at Planck stuff. And where Planck just saw the constant as a, as a contrivance. Einstein looked at it and he thought, oh, gee, that's really stunning. That, that, that means it must be quartal. Radiation must be quartal. And because of his broad knowledge of physics at the time, he said, okay, well, uh, is there another model to look at that, uh, that, that I could usefully look at? And so um, I wrote a paper, by the way, or at least a, a, an essay in the um, Lake Report on Entropy. So I don't know how many of you read it, but I did it because of this was coming up. Um, he compared the entropy or the, 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 the change in radiation from kind of useful radiation to, uh, or at least useful uh, energy to energy uh, that's transformed to a le into a less accessible form. That's called entropy. And he looked at the mathematics for the entropy of a gas and compared it with the entropy, the equations for the entropy of black body radiation. Something Planck didn't think about at all. Turns out the equations are the same. Well, a gas contains particles. It's the very nature. Air contains atoms and maybe a few molecules. So it, look, if, uh, if, if a gas is particle, so must also be or might be black body radiation. So he led to this, he said the black body radiation behaved thermodynamically as if it consisted of mutually independent quanta and provided a way to calculate the energy of a particle of light at a particular frequency. I mean, it's, it's brilliant because he kind of got to the quantal nature of light through the back door because he's talking about the quanta of energy of the black body radiation. But of course, black body radiation includes more than visible light. It includes other radiation, different, different frequencies. And in fact, energy might be quantal. We'll get to that later. So now we'll look at this, uh, the photoelectric uh, effect. And I know there are one or two engineers that are watching this, so my apologies to you. But the photo cell is on your left. And you can see the incident light. Uh, coming in and and, um, and uh, bombarding this little plate at the bottom, and um, uh, with enough energy, um, it can eject electrons from that plate, which then travel to the other plate and cause a current to flow. Now there are two things about this. One is that that uh, if you uh, look at the, if you look at uh, 
what happens with different frequencies of light, lower frequencies of light eject electrons with more energy. But if you stay at one particular frequency, lock it into one particular frequency, and increase the intensity of the light, what happens is the number of electrons ejected increases, but not the energy per electron. That last observation is incompatible with the waveform analysis of energy and radiation. So um, when, when uh, Einstein saw these experimental re results, he thought, wow, okay, this is further evidence that it's quantum. And uh, so I'm not gonna read all of this because I just said it. Uh, so between black body radiation, his analysis of black body radiation and his analysis of, of the um, photoelectric effect, it was pretty clear that light behaved at least sometimes as if it were composed of quanta. Now it's interesting the responses of people to this because Millikan, uh, a physicist in the United States, um, spent 10 years um, looking at Einstein's um, or testing, experimentally testing, uh, Einstein's predictions and equations governing the photoelectric effect. Uh, Millikan believed in the waveform basis for a light, but experiment after experiment showed that that was wrong and that it was quantal. He actually got the Nobel Prize for it. He was still reluctant. He still thought, even when he got the Nobel Prize for it, he thought, um, he thought something's wrong. Well, it wasn't wrong. Anyway, and um, so Einstein, what did he think about the light quantum? He thought of it uh, as a feature of reality, perplexing, pesky, mysterious, and sometimes maddeningly quir uh, quirkish. In the so that's, but still, real. Planck's resistance to believing that the light quanta had a physical reality persisted. He, he, he really, he couldn't get over it, despite those very successful experiments. Um, uh, eight years after Einstein's paper was published, Planck proposed him for a seat in the Prussian Academy of Sciences. So that's, that's, that's right at the top tier. The letter he and other supporters wrote was filled with praise, but Planck added this little caveat at the end, that he might sometimes have overshot the mark in his speculations, as for example, in his light quantum hypothesis, should not be counted against him too much. Isn't that wonderful? It's, a, it's an interesting piece. It's not a personal thing. It's just he couldn't get his head around this quantal nature of energy. And before he died, just before he died, Planck reflect, reflected on the fact that he had long recoiled from the implications of his dis discovery. My futile attempts to fit the elementary quantum of action somehow into the classical theory to make them mesh uh, cost him a great deal of effort. And some of his colleagues saw this something bordering on tragedy. Some people felt the same way about Einstein for that 30 years at Princeton, that he was spinning his wheels for three decades looking for this uh, field theory that would somehow make quantum physics uh, tolerable. So parallels between the two men. Now Brownian motion, um, th this is a lovely one. I mean, it shows you what a really clever person can do with very little. So I mentioned earlier these pollen particles. So the pollen particle is about is several thousand times larger than a water molecule. So a water molecule bumping into this big uh, pollen particle is hardly going to budget around or, or move it 
on its own. So Einstein realized that a bump from a single water molecule wasn't going to do anything. But given the random motion of water molecules um, um, from time to time, enough of them, maybe in their hundreds, might gang up by chance and be enough to bump it and move it on, and push on one side more than the other. And that that was what was happening. And it was really a statistical phenomenon. And um, so one of the wonderful things I like about Einstein is that he made predictions that could be tested. I mean, he kind of made it easy for the uh, for for the critics and the um, and the experimentalists. He almost challenged them, and so he did here with Brownian motion. Um, he he predicted that in the case of a particle with a diameter of say one micron, that's a thousandth of a millimeter. In water 17 degrees centigrade, the mean displacement in one minute would be about six microns. Now, how more precise can you get? Within months, a German experimenter with a powerful microscope found exactly that. Now, think about this. This is a glass of water, and we have the Pollen particles in and they're moving around. But a minute, just, just think about what's been achieved here. By observing the motion, the, the buffeting of these pollen particles, you've established that atoms exist. You've actually got a pretty good idea of what their sizes are. So you, it, this actually represented the best evidence to date, that atoms existed. And that's all from Brownian motion. Interesting. Oh, and I love this little story, the drunk analogy. So, Einstein again, imagining using a drunk and you know, how they stumble around. The best way to, to envision this is to imagine drunk who starts at a lamppost and lurches one step in a random direction every second. And uh, every one or so lurches, he might have gone back or forth to return to the lamp. Or he may be two steps away in the same direction, or one or two west or one step northeast. But a little mathematical plotting reveals an interesting thing about such a random walk. Statistically, the drunk's distance from the lamp will be proportional to the square root, is it square root, I think, of the number of seconds that have elapsed. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? It's, kind of, it's funny. It's, it's a play toy, but um, it's an interesting way of putting it. So um, uh, anyway, the fourth thing in that year, I need say no more. E is equal to mc squared. That is the most iconic equation in all of physics. Um, energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. Now, I mentioned last week, we talked about where does the energy, where does the light come from in the sun? It comes from the extremely high temperatures and pressures in the core of our sun and other stars, jamming helium or, or hydrogen nuclei together. And in the process, a tiny bit of mass is lost. And that mass is converted to energy of the magnitude of the speed of light squared. That's where all of the energy comes from. It takes a tiny bit of mass to create an enormous amount of energy. That's why the interest in nuclear fusion as the perfect uh, source for energy on Earth. Okay. No bad waste. 
It's a uh, energy like the sun. But there's another thing in this. Look, E when you look at when you look at equations, you're looking at equivalence. It's a statement of uh, A is equivalent to B with some function added on the end, something and some other variable. If mass, if mass is made up of particles, it's very likely, just looking at the equation, that energy is too. And that's exactly what the analysis of black body radiation and a photoelectric experiment show. So it's a it's a beautiful equation. It's um, talk about beauty in nature, there it is. And the consequences are enormous. And whether we disappeared as a species tomorrow or 100 million years from now, this equation will remain as accurate. That is the relationship will remain exactly the same then as now. It was there at the genesis of the universe. It will be there at the end. And uh, so it's one of those, if you like, natural laws. So I'm not going to go through all of this. How are we on time? Oh, just to, okay. I want to say a little bit something about, about um, there's lots of stuff I could say here, but I'm going, well, one thing I will. This Annus Mirabilis, meaning the great year. Newton had one during the plague. He went to stay in his mother's home in the countryside for a year in um, 17, or 1666. Well, he made the time pretty productive because he came up with the laws of gravity, the analysis of light spectrum, and calculus. Pretty productive. Einstein came up with the quantum nature of light and had the brilliance to extend that to energy, proved that atoms and molecules existed, relativity, which we haven't touched yet. And E is equal to mc squared. So um, I think that's enough. And I'm not, his last years, I'm just going to say a couple of things about Einstein as a person in his last years. They're, they weren't uh, 30 lost years. He, um, he uh, but it, it was futile in the sense that he was never able to develop a coherent field theory that would support classical physics and, um, and, and quantum theory. So um, uh, he eventually died of an aortic aneurysm. And, um, um, you know, he, but he was very busy. He, was, he became a man of the world and, um, so I'm going to just some of his own thoughts about mortality. So he was he was aware that he had this aortic aneurysm, and um, he says the final transition he was going through was at once natural and somewhat spiritual. The strange, and this is Einstein, the strange thing about growing old is that the intimate identifications with the here and now is slowly lost, he wrote to his friend. One feels transposed into infinity, more or less alone. On his 75th birthday, um, he played playing music and a, a piece of Beethoven's Mises Solemnus, an unusual choice for him for two reasons. One, he tended to regard Beethoven as not his favorite composer because he was too personal, almost naked. And his religious instincts did not usually include those sorts of trappings. He called himself a deep, as a deeply religious non-believer. Anyway, he kept walking toward the end, but he, uh, you know, he was, uh, you may or may not know, but he, he was, uh, asked to be the first president of Israel. He turned it down. I think that's probably why. Uh, then he, I think on the fifth or sixth anniversary of that, was asked to give a speech uh, to um, 
to Israel and uh, as a country and with a projected audience, I think it was around 50 or 60 million, which was pretty big in those days. But there's a wonderful little moment. I mean, he was too ill to travel to Israel. And he's working on the speech and he signed uh, the Einstein Bertrand Russell Manifesto and uh, Alba Eben, I don't know how many of you remember him, uh, the Israeli ambassador, very charming uh, cultured man, to discuss the radio address he, he gives. And imagine the intimacy. I mean, uh, Eben comes around to talk about uh, a talk to millions. And, um, and so he, uh, he brings him into a, a small place and uh, asks him if he'd like a cup of coffee. He spends the next few minutes rattling around in the kitchen making the coffee. And uh, anyway, they, but he said a couple of things, I think, that, about Israel that I, that, um, that I thought were, were one of them in particular that I thought was very important. And this would have been in the speech. The attitude we adopt for the Arab minority will provide the real test of our moral standards as a people. Well, what a statement. So they then, particularly in the context of what's happened since. And uh, so then um, there were various things going on. And then the, the final thing was that uh, um, he had a, a bad day and, and uh, some pain in his abdomen and, and his legs. And uh, doctors came around and su suggested some surgeons that looked uh, there was a possibility of surgery. And he said, no, I don't want anything like that. I, I just, just death is a natural thing and that's what I want. And um, he, so um, around uh, midnight or a little after, whoever was sitting in the out, outside room, heard him um, speak, say a few words in German. Now that's very common for people to speak in their uh, or language of origin that they were brought up with. And that was the last, he said. And then, uh, and then she went into the room and he was slumped in bed and his uh, right arm was followed over the side of the bed and were pages on the floor. And, and it was a mixture. It, he was working on the speech. And, but he was also still working on one page which is full of equations, field equations, uh, still working to the last. So, and, and I should say the other thing, in, in, a, in a personal way, he had his, fa his failures. I mean, he, uh, his relationship with his first wife was very difficult, and he was—he could be mean, and he was mean to her. Um, um, and he didn't get along with his son. And uh, but they did reconcile, I think, in the year or so before. So so that's good, and uh, good to know that that uh, people are human, even if they happen to be a giant in, in some particular area. So uh, next week. We're going to continue on with this story, and it moves next week. The focus is off Einstein. The focus is on Cambridge. It's on Rutherford, and it's on Niels Bohr, and uh, and and the axis in physics has shifted now. It shifted to Cambridge and Copenhagen and away from Berlin. So we'll pick up that thread next week and thank you very, very much. Uh, oh, questions from last week. Um, thank you very much for the questions. Um, uh, one was about, uh, one was about, um, could I explain the theory of relativity in a way that would be um, understandable as a child, well, listen, when I look at relativity, I feel I'm a child. So it's, 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 it is hard to understand, but it's very 
it's relatively easy to visualize it's the way that the author really worked through the stuff. Uh, so I think we'll have a go at that. We are doing that in session five. And uh, so, and by the way, the, there was some um, question about the poet, um, about those ancient, uh, or these was then in ancient times, wondering. The poet is Billy Collins. Billy Collins. So, um, um, is, is that stuff on the, the website? The, the, the poem. Okay, I'm going to put some more stuff on, on the website and uh, we'll go without homework this week. Um, and, uh, but there'll be homework next week. So, uh, next week, Copenhagen and Cambridge University. And, and then uh, the following week, we get back to Einstein and relativity. And then the final one is, will be a, a, a great mishmash of stuff. So it's, we'll, we'll have fun with that one. So all the best to all of you. Bye-bye.